The second generation version of Hyundai's i20 has been usefully improved in this facelifted form. No longer merely a budget choice, it now has the quality, the efficiency, the technology and the looks to square up against the Super Mini class leaders. Plus, it's still got one of the best after-sales packages anywhere in the car industry, and pricing hasn't got too ambitious. In other words, if you're shopping in this segment, here's a car you shouldn't leave off your shortlist. We're used to hearing success stories from Hyundai, but in recent years, there's one important market segment that this Korean company has found something of a struggle, that for super minis. Quite simply, it's never really built one that could go head to head with the class best. That though was exactly the aim with this car, the second generation i20, which we're gonna test here in this significantly facelifted guise. As its name suggests, the i20 slots neatly in between Hyundai's i10 city car and its i30 family hatchback, both impressive but sometimes rather forgotten contenders in their respective sectors. Now you could make the same observation about this i20 because apart from a brief sales spurt following an original launch in 2009, which was boosted by interest generated by the government's short-lived scrappage scheme, it had become a rather forgotten choice in the super mini sector before the arrival of this higher quality Mark II model in early 2015. Now this was a car intended to move this Korean brand's presence in the super mini segment up a gear. To an extent it has, adding usefully to this i20's sales performance in our market, over 125,000 first and second generation versions of this car have now been sold in this country. Since this Mark II model first arrived though, the competition has got a whole lot tougher, with all new models from big brands like Ford, Volkswagen, Nissan, Seat and Citroen shaking up the Super Mini segment. There's also been a new, new version of this Hyundai's direct cousin, the Kia Rio, and it was natural as part of this mid-term Mark II Model i20's updates that we're going to look at here, some of the Rio's more recent technology should be carried forward into this car. Much of this has to do with improvements in media connectivity and safety provision, but there's more to it than that. The three-cylinder, one-litre TGDI turbo petrol engine, which was only latterly a fundamental part of this original Mark II i20 models lineup, has become well-established in this facelifted version, and it can now be ordered with the brand's latest seven-speed dual-clutch automatic transmission. There's also a smarter exterior look, which visually brings this car into line with some of Hyundai's more recent models. So, is it all enough to put this car back into contention with the segment big hitters? Let's find out. Here's a question for you. Now, it might seem a bit facetious, but think about it for a moment. Does it really matter how a Hyundai i20 drives? Well, you might think not. After all, until the launch of the second generation version of this car, typical buyers tended to choose an i20 for its economy, its warranty, and if we're being totally honest, because it was a cheap, safe, worry-free purchase, and they weren't really that interested in cars. The Korean brand could have carried on satisfying those undemanding folk this time around too, but that would have been a dangerous strategy. The cheap Chinese brands, which will soon be with us, and Dacia, who already are, can make super minis of that kind an awful lot more cheaply than Hyundai can sell them. In other words, with this Mark II Model i20, the Korean maker simply had to make a big step forward. If it was going to price this thing against Fiestas, Corsas and Clios in this segment, it had to deliver driving dynamics to match the impressive class standard. Dull to drive, but hey, look what you're paying, was no longer going to cut it. Things had to change this time around. At first glance, there was an offer here though. You might wonder if they actually have. Let's start with what lies beneath the bonnet. Uh, whereas most other major super mini players offer a huge range of petrol and diesel engines with a broad choice of transmissions and a sassy sports model or two at the top of the range to bolster the appeal, Hyundai hasn't done that. Now, to be honest, it's a bit of a puzzle why. After all, you really do have to wonder what the point is of campaigning an i20 in the World Rally Championship and then partly squandering all that expenditure by failing to sell a really quick sporty version. 
The Korean maker would probably argue in response that its priorities have been focused on other more important areas, primarily in trying to catch up with and match the high-tech new generation three-cylinder turbo petrol engines that have given brands like Ford, Volkswagen and Peugeot such an advantage in this class. It's done just that with this one-litre TGDI unit, uh, which matches the efficiency of its rivals while delivering just the same kind of advanced technology. This little three-cylinder motor offers 100 PS and it comes mated to a five-speed manual gearbox, although Hyundai does now offer its seven-speed auto transmission as an option for those who require that. Uh, that dual-clutch self-shifter is a huge improvement over the lethargic old four-speed automatic that was offered in the original version of this second-generation i20 model. But let's say that, like most i20 buyers, you go for the one litre TGDI engine with the manual transmission that we're trying here. Now this gearbox is reasonably slick shifting, which is just as well because you have to use it quite a lot to stay in the sweet spot of this Hyundai's power band. Uh, there's not much acceleration available to you below 2000 RPM, and by the time you crest 3500 RPM, the car's pretty much run out of significant pulling power. Other rival one litre three cylinder turbo petrol units are a Bit more flexible in this regard. Here you have to work around the drive characteristics just a little. We've no issues with the performance though. Uh, in an i20 1 litre TGI 100 PS model like this one, the 62 miles an hour from rest sprint takes 10.8 seconds en route to 117 miles an hour. We can't really see the point in stretching to the 120 PS version of this engine, which Hyundai offers at the top of the i20 range. It delivers the same torque output, 172 Newton meters, as the lesser unit, uh, so it feels no faster. And the benchmark figures are uh, 62 miles an hour uh, from rest in 10.2 seconds, and 118 miles an hour top speed are only fractionally improved. You have to have manual transmission with the 120 PS engine too, although with that Perky unit, the stick shift does get six speeds. Because this Korean brand no longer offers i20 buyers the option of diesel power, there's only one alternative to the one litre TGI power plant in this car, a Lowertec 1.2 litre four cylinder MPI Kappa unit. Now the 84 PS output of that normally aspirated older engine sounds relatively promising and the straight performance stats don't look too bad. Uh, rest to 62 in 12.8 seconds on uh, route to a maximum of 106 miles an hour. On the road though, the MPI variant's modest 120 two Newton meter torque output really shows. For reasonably rapid progress, you either have to row the car along with the five-speed gear lever or rev the whole thing really hard, at which point noise levels begin to become a bit intrusive. It really will pay you to find the small amount extra that Hyundai asks for the faster yet more efficient one liter TGDI turbo unit enough on the engines, although before leaving this subject, we will make one more important point. Uh, you do struggle to hear them. Offhand, it's hard to think of a Super Mini in this segment that's better than this one at suppressing noise, vibration and harshness. Talk to the development team uh, behind this car and they'll bore you for hours with detail on sound deadening material placement, anti-noise pads and the way that the low frequency pad behind the dashboard reduces vibration throughout the cabin. The relatively sleek shape plays its part here too. The bottom line is that all the effort has handsomely paid off, which is one of the things that makes this one of the few super minis in which you'd feel confident in undertaking a really long trip. The carefully tuned suspension setup helps here too. Uh, it's a world away from the somewhat nervous ride quality which characterized the first generation i20 model. It's here replaced by a more grown up, supple demeanor. To be honest though, it feels better at faster speeds than it does at slower ones, and in town, sharp ridges, speed humps or expansion joints can still send a noticeable thump into the cabin. What else? Um, well, earlier we talked about whether rewarding driving dynamics were really important in a car of this kind. Well, if you think they are, then an i20 won't be your super mini of choice. Now, we identified the main reason why when we first tested this second generation design back in 2015, the rather dull, lifeless nature of the electric power steering. In response, Hyundai says it's tweaked the rack of this revised model for a more direct feel and improved on center response, but the difference are uh, hard to discern and they aren't really enough to give this car the kind of driver feedback that you get in say a Fiesta, a Seat Ibiza or even a Volkswagen Polo. 
which is a pity because once you get beyond the way this car responds through the helm, it actually reveals itself as quite an agile little thing, well endowed with grip and traction. Uh, thanks mainly to the 81% improvement in torsional rigidity that's come with this second generation design, body roll is well controlled too. And of course, in its urban environment, this car's much more within its comfort zone. Here, the light steering is a boon, facilitating a tight 10.2 meter turning circle and excellent forward visibility is enabled by these slimmer front A pillars. Uh, the wheel at each corner design makes each extremity of the car easy to position and its simplicity itself to park as just as a super mini should be. Korean brand calls the design of this car a study in elegant simplicity. Well, we're not sure we'd call it that, but there is no doubt that the lightly updated looks of this revised second generation i20 do give the car a bit more personality. Hyundai's usual fluidic sculpture design theme has brought with it confident curves, a low wide stance and a sloping roof line that gives the whole shape a bit of energy. Uh, this cascading style front grille is the key visual update, uh, bringing the look of this car into line with the company's other recent models. Now, while building this in, the stylists have also taken the opportunity to smarten the front bumper and to restyle these fog lamps. Otherwise, it's as you were, which means you still get this thin horizontal upper grille connecting the bifunction headlamps and emphasizing the width of the car. Let's move to the side where the only real change lies with the wheel designs now on offer. Uh, there are 15 or 16 inch rim sizes available. We've got the 16 inches here. A bit disappointingly, our market doesn't get the optional two-tone black roof available to the continental markets, which artfully disguises these blacked out central window pillars. Uh, there is a blacked out rear C pillar too, probably this model's most distinctive profile feature with further dark trim emphasizing these angled lower side moldings. A uh, rising mid-level feature crease flows from headlight to tail lamp cluster. And talking of tail lamps, they represent the major change made here at the back. Uh, these larger clusters now incorporating brighter LED technology on plusher variants like this one. Um, the lower bumper section is more eye-catching too, incorporating these lower cutout sections with the reflector lamps at each corner. Uh, the neat roof spoiler incorporates this high-intensity stop lamp. Far fewer changes have been made to this facelifted Mark II model inside. Uh, the major difference is the standardization of infotainment touchscreen technology. This seven inch color display audio center dash display. Um, air conditioning is now standard across the range too and it's climate controlled on plusher models like this one. And the seat fabrics, uh, they've been upgraded. Otherwise it's all uh, very much as you were, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the cabin is wider than is the case with most rivals. That that makes it feel quite spacious. And there are plenty of soft touch plastics that give a reasonable impression of quality. Well, at least further up the fascia anyway. Uh, a few splashes of silver trim also help to lift the ambiance and provided you avoid entry level trim, you'll find that the steering wheel and the gear lever are covered in leather. Getting comfortable is easy, there's plenty of seat adjustment. Uh, there are there a couple of small issues. Firstly, the backrest angle is unfortunately altered with a lever rather than a more precise rotary dial. And secondly, these front chairs can't be had with lumbar support, even as an option. Uh, still, the steering wheel adjusts over a wide range and through it, you view large clear dials, uh, a speedometer and a rev counter. These separated either by a simple trip computer or the classier looking 4.2 inch driver's Supervision cluster display that's fitted to plosher models like this one. Now earlier we mentioned this cabin's biggest talking point, this seven inch display audio color touchscreen. That's much more neatly integrated into the dash than it is in Hyundai's larger i30 model. Unfortunately, there's no separate iDrive style control for this display, such as you'd get in say a rival Mazda 2, but we like the ease of use of this setup with its clear, neat graphics and usefully large flanking shortcut buttons. This is your interface for controlling the usual DAB audio, Bluetooth and informational features, plus you can use it to connect in your handset using the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems. On plush variants like this one, this monitor also includes satellite navigation and a package of TomTom Tom Live services, which alert you to speed cameras, update you on the weather and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. 
All round visibility is very good, helped by these slim windscreen pillars, and they give you a wide view ahead when you're negotiating roundabouts and junctions. Plus, most models get rear parking sensors too. Uh, there aren't really any issues with cabin ergonomics either. Uh, now, Hyundai's use what it calls functional clustering of the key technologies around the high-set asymmetric dash, a grouping together of key instrumentation items like the audio, the heating, and the ventilation systems to create a cleaner looking fascia. And we would point out though that a few minor switches are rather hidden away down here by the driver's right knee. And the pedals, they're a little bit uh, offset to the right, although that does leave room for a raised left foot rest. Uh, these air vents demonstrate a particularly thoughtful level of design in the way that they uh, neatly overhang the dashboard into the doors and they've been shaped to provide a better airflow around the cabin. On to the day-to-day -day practicalities of living with this car, which have been as well thought out as you'd expect. Uh, take the stowage spaces that are scattered around the cabin. These two big cup holders beside the handbrake, a usefully sized centre console box, uh, the air-conditioned glove box, this sunglasses holder up here, and decently sized door pockets that are large enough to swallow a 1.5 litre bottle. Uh, there are also trinket trays in the doors and an area in front of the gear lever that is the right size for your smartphone. It's all very well thought through. Right, time to move into the rear. Now you'd expect the i20 to fare pretty well here because it is, after all, one of the largest models in the class, measuring in at well over four meters long, following the 45 mil of extra wheelbase added into this second generation design. Access is pretty good because the doors open wide. Now the combination of this and the relatively high roof means it'll be quite easy for parents to reach in and install child seats or to tend to their little ones. Once inside, you'll find this Hyundai has as much rear space for legs and knees as you could reasonably expect in this class. Uh, only Skoda's Fabia, Seat Sabitha and Volkswagen's Polo match it in this regard. And popular contenders in this sector like Ford's Fiesta and Vauxhall's Corsa are noticeably more cramped. Headroom isn't quite so noteworthy thanks to that tapering rear roof line, but the notably wide exterior width of 1734 mils means it's more realistic to take a trio of passengers back here than it would normally be in a car of this class. Uh, the relatively low centre transmission tunnel helps here too. Uh, the three people concerned would still need to be on pretty friendly terms though. What else? Um, well, map pockets in the back of the front seats are standard and the door pockets are youthfully large. Uh, they're able to take a 750 mil bottle of water. Now let's finish this section with a look at the boot. Uh, lift the hatch and you're greeted with one of the most accommodating luggage areas in the segment. 326 litres in size in this five door variant. Uh, to give you some perspective, that's uh, 34 litres more than you'll get in a Fiesta and 46 litres more than is offered by the Volkswagen Polo. In fact, it's only 69 litres smaller than the boot you'll get in the Hyundai i30 in the next class up. There's certainly be no problem in taking something like a baby buggy. True, there is quite a lip to haul your stuff over, but the trunk area itself is broad, deep and well shaped and uh, the 1027mm wide opening is one of the broadest in the segment. Uh, a couple of bag hooks are provided and we'd want the optional boot liner too to keep the floor clean. Uh, most i20 models also add flexibility into the mix by providing a useful two-stage luggage floorboard that can be moved up or down to conceal items and create additional storage options. When it's raised and you push forward the split folding rear bench, you get an uninterrupted, completely level loading floor and 1,042 litres of cargo capacity. Hyundai long ago dispensed with the notion of bargain brand pricing, so it's no surprise to find this Y20 pitched at about the same level as most of its mainstream super mini segment competitors in the 14 to 19,000 pound bracket. The range is built around two petrol engines, uh, the brand's Oldertec 1.2 litre 84 PS unit, or for 900 pounds more, the infinitely preferable 1 litre TGDI 100 PS three cylinder turbo power plant that we're trying here. Both are primarily mated to five-speed manual transmission and there are now no diesels on offer. 
Uh, the two core trim levels are base SE, or as here, uh, premium nav. The five-door lineup also adds two further options, entry-level S-Connect and top premium SE nav. Um, if you go for the latter plushest option and you select that one-litre TGDI engine that we'd recommend, you'll get that in uprated 120 PS form, in which, guys, the engine is mated to a six-speed manual gearbox. It's also the five-door that you'll need if you want to be able to specify automatic transmission. Uh, the brand Brand's latest seven-speed DCT dual-clutch unit is a 1,250-pound option with 100 PS versions of the 1-litre TGDI engine. Now, time to see how those kinds of figures stack up against obvious rivals. Uh, whatever kind of i20 you have in mind, do uh, remember when you're making your comparisons that quite a few obvious competitors have model lineups that begin with smaller output power plants and the base 84 PS 1.2 litre unit that's on offer here. And they use trim structures that start lower than the one Hyundai uses here. So they look a bit cheaper at the budget end of the range. Uh, if you compare against an equivalent engine option though, uh, you should find this i20 to be very tightly priced, especially when you consider the specification. Uh, let's get specific and let's start with the segment Big Hitters. A directly comparable Ford Fiesta will cost you fractionally more. An equivalent Volkswagen Polo retails at about the same level and the similarly specced Vauxhall Corsa will probably cost you fractionally less. In terms of comparisons closer to home for Hyundai though, uh, the Kia Rio, which shares virtually all of this i20's engineering, will save you around £1,000 in this price terms. As for the other five-door only super mini options you could look at in this segment, well, you could save about £1,500 by choosing a model like the Renault Clio, uh, the Nissan Micra, the Seat Ibiza, the Suzuki Swift or the Honda Jazz, or maybe half that with an equivalent Mazda 2, uh, Peugeot 208 or Toyota Yaris. Few of those rivals, though, can match the size of this Hyundai's large boot or its impressive five-year warranty. And once you spec them up comfortably to an i20 and then take into account the deal that your Hyundai dealer will probably be able to offer, the price difference may not be as great as you first thought. Of course, there are super many alternatives in the segment that will save you a more significant amount. A Citroen C3 with a PureTech 84 engine could theoretically save you up to £3,000, but with comparable spec, the difference now is rapidly. And with the turbo petrol power we'd recommend, a C3 wouldn't really save you much over an i20 at all. And the Citroen, like most cars in this class, will be worth a lot less than this Hyundai when the time comes to sell it. Uh, perhaps a better choice is Skoda's Fabia, which in comparable SE form would save you about £2,000 over an i20 with the same level of spec. Otherwise, though, there's really not much in this sector that can match the value proposition which is on offer here, unless you choose a real bargain basement brand option like Dacia Sandero or the MG3. Do that and you'll have to accept lower standards of build quality and technology plus residual values which could decimate much of your upfront saving when the time comes to sell. If having considered all that and looked closely at the deal you're being offered, you conclude that it is an i20 that you really want, then you're going to need to know more details about this car's standard specification. And it's at this point that this car might really start selling itself to you. After all, even the base S Connect variant comes with quite a haul. Air conditioning, a rear view parking camera, auto headlamps, and a seven inch touchscreen audio system with Bluetooth, a DAB tuner, and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Stretch to the mid-range SE trim that most customers choose and the kit tallow widens to include 15-inch alloy wheels, LED daytime running lights, rear parking sensors and front fog lamps, plus a package of camera-driven safety items that we'll cover off in a minute. Inside, in an SE 120 model, there's a smarter feel thanks to leather covering for the steering wheel and the gear knob, plus you get cruise control with a speed limiter, a variable height boot floor and on the 1.2-litre versions, a space over spare wheel. Here, as mentioned earlier, we've opted to test a premium nav model, which, as the name suggests, means that you get navigation added into the touchscreen infotainment system. Visual enhancements at this level include larger 16-inch alloy wheels, rear privacy glass and LED rear lights. Plus, premium nav i20 buyers also get power folding mirrors, headlamps that turn with the bends, uh, front parking sensors, an auto dimming rear view mirror and climate control with an automatic demist function for the windscreen. Um, 
As for top premium SE nav trim, well, that gives you a full length opening panoramic glass roof, heat for the steering wheel and for the front seats, keyless entry and crime effect door handles. Now, as usual with Hyundai, there aren't many options. Uh, the brand prefers to encourage you to simply move up a trim grade if you want more kit, but there are a wide range of accessories that can be ordered through your dealer. Uh, there are the usual roof bars in aluminium or steel, and there are mud guards, a tow bar, and protective side mouldings are available. Plus, you can specify protection film for the rear bumper and for the door handles. In terms of cosmetic stuff, uh, you can add a side trimming strip, chromed mirror covers, and special tailgate trim plus there's a couple of extra 15 inch alloy wheel designs. Uh, inside you can add blue or white LED footwell illumination, a hook for takeaway carrier bags, carpet mats, uh, front wind deflectors, entry guards to protect the front door sills and a smartphone holder. You can also pay extra for clothes hangers or tablet holders to go on the back of the front seat headrests. Um, we'd want to look at the boot liner that's available with or without a luggage under tray and the boot storage cargo net too. A dog guard's also available. Enough on this car's general specification. Uh, let's now move on to talk more specifically about safety provision. And that's an area that uh, Hyundai has invested heavily in with this revised second generation model. Uh, the original version of this Mark II i20 had very little camera driven safety kit at all. With this facelifted range though, things are very different. And that's thanks to the provision of the brand's Safety Sense suite of driver aids. Now, as long as you avoid entry level S Connect trim, uh, your car will come as standard with AEB and that's the brand's autonomous emergency braking system. Now this is one of those uh, setups that as you drive scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards. If one's detected you'll be warned. Um, if you don't respond or well perhaps you aren't able to then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Virtually all i20s also get three other key features. High beam assist automatically dips your headlights for you in the face of oncoming traffic at night. Driver attention alert monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and if necessary, it'll prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee. And lane keep assist will not only warn you if you've drifted out of your lane on the highway, but it'll also apply corrective steering assistance to gently move the car back to where it should be on the road. It's also worth making the point that this i20 is inherently safe too, and that's thanks to its high strength steel construction. That's something that helped the original version of this Mark II model achieve a five star Euro NCAP crash test rating. As you expect too, all the usual safety features are present and correct across the range. Things like twin front side and curtain airbags, uh, ice fix child seat fastenings, tire pressure monitoring, anti whiplash head restraints, and HAC hill start assist control control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Uh, you get all the usual electronic assistance for the braking system, which aids you in panic stops, which are advertised to following motorists by an ESS, emergency stop signal setup, which uh, flashes the hazard lights when you slam on the anchors. And of course, there's uh, stability control. Uh, the latter feature is included as part of this Hyundai's clever VSM, Vehicle Stability Management Setup. It's a system which will stabilize the car if one side of it has more traction than the other. Uh, let's say there's ice, standing water or wet leaves at the side of the road. The five-year unlimited mileage warranty used to be one of the main reasons for buying a Hyundai. Today, of course, there are other attractions, but the warranty is still one of the best in the business, and it helps to boost the residual values of the car. Now, imagine you bought a Hyundai i20 and your neighbor bought a Fiesta, and you both sell your cars after three years. Anyone buying the Ford would be on their own, whereas the Hyundai buyer would be able to transfer the residual two years of the warranty, and that's a huge draw card. Oh yes, you could point out that sister brand Kia offers a seven year warranty, but that has a 100,000 mile limit, making the Hyundai Unlimited mileage package arguably more comprehensive. As well as a warranty, Hyundai offers annual health checks on the i20 for five years and five years of roadside assistance. Uh, there's an additional 10 year anti-perforation warranty for the bodywork. 
None of which would matter very much if day-to-day -day running costs weren't uh, to be up to scratch. Fortunately, Hyundai seemed to have done just enough to keep up, primarily in developing its own three-cylinder turbo petrol unit, and that's badged as the one-litre TGDI uh, to rival those engines of a similar configuration provided by many key rivals. If you are buying an i20, we'd urge you to try to negotiate your way into a TGDI model. Apart from anything else, as we'll see in a moment, the fuel and CO2 stats for this 100 PS turbo turbo unit are significantly better than those delivered by the older tech 1.2 litre MPI 84 PS engine. Both the petrol power plants, Hyundai has lost interest in providing diesel in this segment. So let's get to the figures, all of which uh, this time around are boosted by the standard fitment of an engine start-stop system. Now we'll base them around uh, volume SE trim. Obviously the larger wheels fitted further up the range will take a few percentage points off the readings that we're about to quote. With the five-door body shape, the base four-cylinder, normally aspirated 1.2-litre MPI unit delivers 51.4 mpg on the combined cycle and 126 grams per kilometre of CO2. Moving to the preferable 1.0-litre TGDI 100 PS three-cylinder turbo engine, which features a particulate filter, you're looking at 56.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 114 grams per kilometre of CO2 for manual or automatic versions of the five-door SE 100 PS model. The five-door variant also adds in a 120 PS manual-only version of the 1.0-litre TGDI engine at the top of the range. Uh, for that, the figures are 54.3 mpg and 118 grams per kilometre. What else? Um, well, insurance groupings. Now, they should be affordable. With the five-door body shape, the same engine attracts widely varying 6E, 9E or 10E ratings, depending on the trim level that you choose. Moving to the 1.0-litre TGDI 100 PS turbo petrol unit, you're looking at group 13E or 14E if you choose five doors. The 1.0-litre TGDI 120 PS turbo petrol power plant is rated at group 15E. As for servicing, well, your i20 will need regular garage visits every 12 months or 10,000 miles, whichever comes first. Uh, maintenance shouldn't set you back too much either, as consumables like brake pads and tyres tend to be cheap, plus engines like the 1.2-litre petrol unit feature a maintenance-free long-life timing chain. Uh, you can also choose a three- or five-year fixed-price servicing plan if you really want to take the nasty surprises out of ownership. And finally, residual values should stand up very well with recent history suggesting that after the usual three-year ownership period, you'll get 43.5% of the initial purchase price back. That's about the same as a rival Volkswagen Polo and about 10% better than you'll get from something like a Citroen C3. One statistic tells you a lot about this i20. 88% of existing owners buy another, a figure almost double that of typical rivals in the segment. Evidently then, people like it once they've tried it, and you can see why. Certainly it's hard to think of many super minis that would be easier to live with than this one. Few others are more practical or better built. And although pricing has crept up a bit more than we'd like, this car still remains reasonably affordable to buy. To these sensible virtues, this improved second generation model adds a sleeker shape and most of the high-tech features that you now expect from a modern contender in this class. Of course, it isn't perfect. The base 1.2-litre MPI petrol power plant isn't as efficient as it could be, and whatever engine you choose, there's nothing particularly interesting about the driving experience this car has to offer. The value proposition doesn't initially seem that eye-catching either, well, until you take into account that even affordable versions of this i20 include, as standard, infotainment features and camera-driven safety kit that rival models usually restrict to their priciest variants. In summary, it all adds up to a pretty complete package. In our experience, there aren't too many other cars in this class that make more sense when you add together all the really important attributes that families look for in a Super Mini in this segment. And these are, after all, times that more than ever call for sensible decisions, like purchase of an i20. Well, if your target market for this car, you might well think so.